Welcome to What's Not Priced In, a weekly investor podcast by Fattail Investment Research. In a world of confusion and rapid change, experts Kirill Prakopenka and Greg Canavan look behind the headlines to unveil the hidden opportunities within the Australian stock market. Now, let's dive in to today's episode. G'day everyone and welcome to episode 16 of the What's Not Priced In podcast. Uh, you'll obviously note that Kirill's not with us today. Uh, we've got a special uh, interview episode for you this week, uh, so you won't be hearing Kirill and I's banter. Uh, but I do have a, a really interesting interview for you with a guy called Aiden Morrison. Uh, I run into Aiden on Twitter. Someone uh, pointed out that he was doing some pretty interesting stuff on the energy transition. So I reached out to him and requested that we chat about it in a bit more detail. And Aiden's one of the few guys that are really digging into the numbers on the CSIRO's GenCost report and AMIO's uh, ISP, which is the Integrated System Plan. Now, these are the two of the key documents that form the uh, energy transition plans and, and underpin the government's aims to get to 80% renewables by 2030, and obviously the, the key uh, the key aim of net zero by 2050. So a lot of uh, these these reports are obviously very important for that transition. Uh, and Aiden has dug into the numbers and found some very, very big holes in them, uh, which come down to the cost of the transition. This is something uh, that I've been discussing with our clients at Fat Tail Investment Research for some time. Uh, and I th- and the, the basis of that is that these uh, this massive transition has not been costed properly. So I won't go into any of the detail now in this intro, but uh, the interview uh, that follows with Aiden, uh, really, really encourage you to watch it. Uh, leave some comments uh, if you have any issues with it. Uh, one of the telltale signs that I think that uh, Aiden is doing some good work is that he's being um, a- attacked quite heavily by the renewals advocates and uh, called, I think, something along the lines of a conspiracy dude on Twitter. Uh, Now, when you get called a conspiracy uh, dude or a conspiracy theorist, you pretty much know you're on the right track in terms of uh, finding out some information that, uh, you know, the powers that be or the people that stand to benefit the most from this transition uh, are not happy about what you're uncovering. Just the other thing to note as well, uh, when we talk about this transition, is that the market, I don't think, buys this at all. And one of the things that you've got to look at is commodity prices. And we're we're always told how much demand uh, commodities are going to be. Now, lithium obviously has been in the news uh, recently with the takeover offer for Liontown. Uh, And clearly, lithium is is going to uh, be in increased use uh, in the years to come. But we're constantly told uh, how much we're undersupplied of copper, cobalt, nickel, all those sorts of things. Yet those commodity prices continue to languish. Now, if the market really believed that this transition was going to happen as the politicians tell us it is, you would be seeing those prices bid up a lot more in order to encourage the new supply to come onto market. So that's not happening, uh, which which suggests to me the market is very sceptical about the huge demand uh, required in the in the years to come. And a couple of other things that uh, just to note is that the Aussie 10-year bond yield uh, has come down off its highs a little bit, but really hasn't too much given that we are seeing a market slowing in the economy. And the uh, GDP numbers that come out yesterday, uh, they were the headline number was slightly better than expected. But when you look at the nominal GDP figure, it actually contracted in the June quarter for the first time in a long time. And we've seen really strong nominal growth in the post-COVID era, thanks to huge fiscal stimulus. So that was a really interesting development. The economy is slowing quite markedly. Uh, 10-year bond yields aren't coming down that high. And I think that relates to a lot of the, the costs that are being embedded or starting to be priced into the, the economy longer term from this energy transition. Because essentially what we're doing here is transitioning to a very high cost energy system and retiring the lower cost uh, uh, base load electricity that we've got in the system. Now that is going to create a very unstable grid. It's going to create higher prices, uh, and it's going to create a very 
uh, unproductive economy. And uh, if you want to look at how that's being priced in, you could maybe look at bond markets. You can certainly look at the Aussie dollar, which is now back down to uh, levels last seen since November last year. Um, and look, there's other factors involved in that as well. Uh, but I can't help but think that you know, in the background, international investors are looking at the way that we're managing this transition and thinking, you know, perhaps Australia is not the safest destination for capital investments. And even the uh, big renewables uh, players uh, might be second guessing whether they want to continue with the uh, the investments that have been uh, earmarked or, or planned for. And we're seeing that in, um, you know, just we're not getting the, the capacity online. Transmission lines haven't been built. There's not the social license for it. So there's a whole host of problems. Uh, I'll stop talking now. We'll get on to the interview with Aidan. As I said, it's a really, really interesting uh, interview. He reveals a lot of information that you're not going to see anywhere or haven't really heard about in the mainstream media. So um, I hope you enjoy it. And then Kirill and I will be back for normal transmission uh, next week. Aidan Morrison, thanks very much for joining us today. Great to be here, Greg. So uh, I bumped into you uh, via someone sending me a Twitter link uh, where you're involved in some interesting analysis over the past couple of months. Uh, but before we get into that, uh, you describe yourself as a lapsed physicist. So maybe you could just give uh, viewers and, and listeners a little bit of background into your uh, your expertise. Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, I studied physics at university, um, did straight physics at ANU and uh honors in theoretical physics, um, studied in nuclear physics as well, um, and started a PhD, quit the PhD to become an entrepreneur. Um, that was actually in, a, in the military technology space. Um, and uh, I've got an eclectic career, fell into hospitality, actually. So I became a barista and bartender while sort of couch surfing on my investors' couches, friends and family around, um, and uh, ended up doing more and more of that. And uh, um, yeah, owned a, owned a bar restaurant for a while pivoted into economic analysis for a short while and learned to code and then launched a startup in um, basically sort of machine learning to do uh, time series forecasting for hospitality. I was trying to use the data set that I had in the, in the hospitality business um, and then eventually needed to get a real job, um, sort of, you know, uh, Real family, reality hits family called exactly and so became a contracting uh, data scientist basically doing a variety of things um, but last few years has been in trading uh, building optimizations sort of algorithms and setups for um, for trading systems um, yeah so I'm, I'm not necessarily an energy professional I've got a very eclectic kind of background um, but I've got some skills in data and uh, and code and know how to think um, about physical systems um, and yeah just sort of stumbled upon this um, energy debate i mean i've always been interested in it been a bit of a fan of nuclear energy um but yeah sort of uh found this debate and a particular glaring horrible um piece of work that was used as a sort of total king hit um this is how much it costs uh stop your argument right there kind of thing against all the people questioning the renewable system yep. and i you know just just decided to swing back uh which did a little more vigorously than anyone else has and um and yeah that's sort of that's sort of where this story began yeah, and, and, you know, I think you, you certainly sort of uh, hit your targets quite well uh, in that analysis. So perhaps we can just give a little bit of context. A, a mate of mine at work forwarded me on one of your tweets, and 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 the reason why he forwarded it to me is because I've been talking about this stuff for quite a while, and I don't have the type of analytical data, analytical skills that you do, and, and probably didn't have the time, the knowledge, the expertise to look in to those data sets. And I think I'm a, I'm like a lot of people in Australia who are of the view that, hang on, there's something not quite right about this. And we're always told that renewables are the cheapest form of energy, but I'm not actually quite sure how that could be when wind and solar are a, a very inefficient form of energy generation compared to traditional fossil fuels in that the, the energy denseness is, is not there. We need to build a massive transmission system in order to link everything up. So common sense tells you or at least mm. asks you to question yeah. how can that be the cheapest form mm. of energy mm. yet we are told by our climate change minister um that it is the case and nuclear is by far and away not a cost competitive form of energy when it comes to renewables mm -hmm. so everyone just shut up and listen to us because we're on the right track and we're building this uh, energy transition and we're going to get to net zero yeah. by 2050. We're going to get to 82% uh, renewables by 2030 uh, and we just need to hurry up and do it regardless yeah. of cost. 
So you come up, you had a look at the gen cost, which is a CSIRO study, right. which yeah. is the basis for a lot of these claims. Yeah. And that's where you come up and you went, uh, actually, this doesn't make sense. So perhaps we could go into that in a bit of detail. Yeah, yeah, sure. You're absolutely right. So I, I agree with that take that, you know, the, what what we're being asked to believe sort of goes against your intuitive guesses. I mean, like, and and not just versus nuclear. The first one that I always come up to is kind of like, hang on, we've had coal for quite a while in this country and energy has been relatively cheap for a long time it's getting more expensive now and and that's the other claim that's made by this gen cost re, um, report is that actually renewables are cheaper than coal too and i i always found that surprising Absurd. like you know to kind of think that that's um that what you know we're being told to believe that what we had before which is very cheap is no longer cheap um and this new thing is cheaper so it's it is quite strong claims in the um in the uh in the gen cost report and the key to it is in this the executive summary kind of headline graph um, the explanation of that is that here's a cost for renewables in 2030 that includes the integration costs, that includes the storage and the firming. Um, you know, that extra machinery that's required to take an intermittent source and deliver reliable energy, as you pointed out, it's extra transmission, it's extra storage. That's why this gen cost report is such a powerful um, piece because it's, it's, its headline graph claims to include that extra stuff. And that's why all these kind of, you know, renewal advocates... We're using it so aggressively on debates on Twitter as it's absolute king hit slapdown. Yeah, we've got that covered. Look at the CSIRO. Look, they include all this integration stuff. Um, so that was the executive summary of that that first chart. If you get down to around page 50, roughly halfway through the report, there's an explanation of how they model their integration costs. And there they say that they have basically uh, got a business as usual case, which includes every bit of infrastructure that we plan on building, hope to build, up to 2030. And guess what? That includes all the core kind of trunk transmission, the very biggest bits that we have to build connecting South Australia, Melbourne and Sydney to the Snowy Hydro system. It includes the Snowy Hydro system too. It includes links to Tasmania, pumped hydro things in Tasmania. It includes um, a couple of gas peaker plants. It includes like a whole heap of the biggest, most core foundational bits of the renewable supporting system. Guess what we need to build it this decade? We need to build it in a hurry so that we can have such a high renewable system and they have modeled that as a business as usual as said as in that's that's something it's already, it's already built it, they're essentially saying we're going to act as though it's already built and paid for and therefore we don't need to count the cost of those systems as part of our integration of renewable systems after that and um i was absolutely flummoxed by that i think it's sort of such a disingenuous argument um the analogy I use is, you know, is if you sort of said, um, you know, what does it cost to land a man on the moon? But then you start your cost analysis when you already have your rocket halfway to the moon and you're just, just coming into land. And you've assumed business as usual was to build a rocket, launch it in the direction of the moon with a man on it in the first place, right? That's, it's, it's the most outrageously disingenuous kind of um, um, sort of cost basis for the, the integration of renewables because so much of the important stuff you have to do first. And, uh, and so I found that almost hard to believe and um, realized when I got down to the end of the report, there's actually an appendix justifying it. And that's because other people had already written to the CSIRO, um, Dave Carlin's one of them. Um, and he'd written and complained about this approach. And there was an appendix um, replying, trying to quash this complaint. Um, and that appendix was truly outrageous um, because they basically gave this neat little lecture about how we need price signals for generators to be built in the, by the private investors efficiently. Um, and we have to be able to say that we don't owe those guys a reasonable return on investment so they get the right price signals to invest. And this is absolutely outrageous because all the infrastructure that was in that business, the usual case, was not privately funded generators, but massive transmission projects, which are part of the regulated asset base. So we get some, you know, private equity or sovereign wealth fund to build that. And then we promise them, we write them a guarantee that we'll keep paying them the right price for that for as long as it's in service, right? So we, we, we get someone else to pay for it. And then we promise to pay for it for the rest of the time while it's built. So this kind of this kind of appendix used to refute or dismiss the concerns that I was raising that was just so wildly irrelevant to the actual concern that was being raised. 
that's I suppose why I arced up and swung back hard on Twitter because it was just so clear that this was this was an, a really egregious, dishonest represent um, you know unhelpful representation yeah. of what was going to happen to our energy system. And so, and so I'm not the first person to discover this. Other people have been looking at this for a long time. Other people have raised it. Other, other people have obje- objected, and those objections have been ignored basically. I'm just the guy that got a little bit louder, swung a little bit harder, maybe the guy on social media that got a little bit of coverage. But this is not the first time people have objected to this. It's it's uh, it's I'm I'm just one at the end of a string uh, of people. It's just happened to have now got that little bit of traction, which is uh, which is really important. Wow, there's a couple of couple of questions that stem from that. Firstly, do you have uh, have you done any analysis on the total costs that have effectively been? ignored or have been assumed to have already been invested are we talking hundreds of billions or it's at least tens of billions i haven't done it and i don't really want to try to pin that down and that's because the wording that um the wording that the csro has that in the in little paragraph is sufficiently vague that i i can't i can't really create a proper table of what all those costs would be they say things like it should be built by or around 2030 or needed by so whether it's actually built by or needed by is a little bit different. A lot of these timetables have a sort of a 2030 to 2031, like a kind of two year spanning. So I, I can't do that properly with confidence. Yep. Um, so, and and as well, there's other projects in there, like um, the, they mentioned the Battery for the Nation, um, which is a Tasmanian pumped hydro concept, right? That's mentioned specifically in this business as usual. It is only a concept. It's never been advanced by that stage. There's not even serious costings for it. So so to be honest, I, I can't do a good job of trying to pin that down. I, I do believe that Dave Carland uh, and how to go at that and came up with a $62 billion figure. Um, it sounds like it's broadly in the right ballpark, but it's in my mind, it's CSIRO's mess to clean up. If they want to clarify exactly what the value of all that stuff is in that sunk cost, um, that business as usual case, they should do that. Um, I know it's heaps, but I don't really care whether it's $2 billion or $200. Um, they're cutting out important critical parts of the system. And the dishonesty and the disingenu- in, disingenuity of that is um, is what we should be concerned about. Um, so, yeah, I, it's 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 tens of billions, definitely. Exactly how many? Don't know. So, assuming assuming away all those costs, I guess the point is that that is what allows the report to claim that renewables are the cheapest form of energy from 2030 onwards, because all those other costs have already been uh implemented and they don't factor in into that analysis so the reality is that we are following a policy path that is built on a completely false claim yep that's right it's a a total misunderstanding because and and the the kind of technical kind of get out of jail card which has been attempted to be played on this is to say that we said that it was the marginal integration costs from 2030 right and that's a that's an absolute horrendous kind of weasel word way to get out of it because they you know if, if if you do say that yeah we're going to consider that as sunk cost then you could describe it as the marginal but the problem is is that the policy should be guided by what's going to affect our actual electricity bills that's 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 the thing that should guide our um our, our policy framework are we choosing the right choice to go down this whole path and basically the not the mar- the marginal has nothing to do with that you know if it's the cheapest thing to add to an expensive system in 2030 that might be true but you need to know the cost of the full system and everything you've built after yep. 2030 to understand what your electricity costs are going to do and what your what your you know your power bills are going to be so everybody i think including right up to the minister and this is crazy right the minister is acting as though the more renewables we add into the grid the cheaper things are going to get and that is just blatantly untrue because you need to you need to factor in the whole system. We have components of our bill, which are the distribution, the transmission system. Um, the fact that you can add cheap bits later on means nothing if you are still paying. And that's the way the regulated asset base works for transmission distribution. You are still paying for the whole system that you have built and are using all the time. So, so it's 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 been in, it's been assumed because of this. You know, there's a few technical qualifiers. It's from 2030. They say it's the marginal. But people have taken exactly the wrong impression from that and said this should be the indicator of what our power prices will do. And that that is absolutely wrong. You need the full integrated, mathematically integrated, where you add up all the bits as you go along. You need that full um, uh, that full picture to understand what's going to happen to power prices. And that's not what the CSIRO Gen Cost Report has done. I was going to ask you, as a data scientist, like how how shocking is it to you that we have got this far down the path in the in the energy transition where this 
isn't even debated really in parliament. I mean, there's not, we're talking about fringe people like you and I raising these issues, yet it hasn't been brought up as a as a major policy flaw. And I think the important point to note here, and we, we spoke about this previously, this is not a political argument. To me, this is an economic argument. What what are the investments that we are making in our country? And energy infrastructure is absolutely critical to any country in, in wanting to achieve uh, rising living standards over time. So what type of uh, energy infrastructure are we building for our future generations here? It, it seems to me that it is absolutely shocking. We have got to this point and no one of any prominence is really talking about it. Yeah, that's right. Um that's exactly right. But in terms of as a data scientist, I don't have anything to add because it didn't actually require any data science skills to do that. Like, you know, to do in terms of that, that was just from a PDF. I didn't open up any data packs at all. I just I just asked the right questions and looked at the right fine print and did a double take and said, "Is does that mean what I think it means? Um, but um, the, the right, you asked the right question, but every man on the street should be coming to the same conclusion and saying, how on earth did we get here where we are basically drawing the wrong conclusion? We're drawing a conclusion from a document that is totally unfit to support the conclusion. And that's exactly what the column that was written by Alex Corum in The Australian yesterday was saying, is basically saying these documents, they don't support that conclusion that is being drawn from them. That's not what they have actually done. Um, so... Yeah, that's it is, a, it is uh, getting out there a little bit. And yesterday being so, uh, Thursday, the 31st of August, we're recording this on uh, Friday uh, around lunchtime, the 1st of September. So there, there is, uh, these issues are getting raised more, but I guess the next qu uh, question would be, you know, you're, you're receiving a little bit of, um, uh, I wouldn't say criticism, but, but a little bit of pushback uh, in terms of the claims you're making. What, what, what are the, what, what, what sort of standard criticism are you, are you receiving and do you think it holds any weight? Yeah. Um, no. Uh, as in there's, there's, there's very little pushback that's come um, that's substantive and actually critiquing what I'm saying. Like, you know, to be honest, this has, this has landed heavily because there's, what I've said has stood up um, perfectly. In fact, the response to Claire Lemon's first article, which she wrote quoting my work on uh, on Twitter and a little blog post that was put up uh, following that, that elicited a response from the uh, from the chief, cost chief energy, economist. That's yeah. right. The the chief energy economist at CSIRO, the principal author of that report, wrote back in the Australian, and he confirmed indeed that those costs were omitted. And he saw nothing wrong with that, right? Like, and he said, "Oh, that's the that's the job of another project, which we'll get to the integrated system plan from AEMA." Yeah. Yep. And and so it's, there, to be honest, there is there has been a flight from the gen cost. Like, the, nobody's nobody's come back and said, "No, actually, Aiden, you've got that fact wrong," because Paul Graham has stood up and said, "You've got that fact right." All right. So now the only response has been to pivot, hard pivot to the ISP and say, "The ISP does that project. They add up, add up all the costs and." They show that everything's still affordable. And that is the next question which we can get to because that also on inspection turns out to be utterly false, right? And so the, the type of pushback that I'm getting now, which is um, which is really crazy and it's um, it's scary to see, is more or less just this blind assertion, this appeal to authority, particularly to a press release that was produced by AEMO after Claire Lemon's second article quoting my work. And that press release, the title of it is uh, ISP Reflects Whole of System Costs. And that is a lie. There's, there's no other word for it. It is, it is factually incorrect. And so the, 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 the strongest and most common response that I'm getting now is literally people like Chris Bowen. And it, there's a few other lemmings on Twitter who will do this, but Chris Bowen is the only one of significance who's just repeating and asserting with just a point blank appeal to authority. AEMO says... Their, their model, the ISP, uh, reflects the whole system costs. And that's just not true. It's And that, that's what's wild, is that we now have a situation where we have, have an energy minister quoting a statutory authority, which he's a major stakeholder and he's not quite technically in charge of it, but he's a major stakeholder in, that has just lied to the public to quash a perfectly substantiated critique from an in, that was leveled in a national um, broadsheet. So, so well, that's wild. Into that, no, what, 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 what is it in particular that they're lying about? They have claimed that the ISP reflects the whole of system cost. 
and that's not true. I don't know. Is, is now is now the right time to start on the kind of what the ISP does and doesn't do? Um, well, let, let's get into it. And I think it's a really good time actually to talk about AMIO itself because yesterday, Thursday, the thirty first of August, they come out with a report warning of blackouts and and issues uh, in Australia's electricity mm. uh, network in the coming summer because. I'm sure uh, our next hot summer will be blamed on climate change, but it'll just be a standard summer that we've had for you know in in decades past. And our electricity system doesn't seem to be up to uh, up to the challenge. So the ISP is the Integrated System Plan, which is mm. I think it's it's produced by AMIO every two years, where right. they provide an update on all the different transmission renewable projects that need to be built and integrated into the system by, I guess, under a different uh, a number of different scenarios. Is that that's roughly correct? Yeah, that that's that's roughly correct. But there's a there's a nuance to that though, um, and that is that the AEMO's primary focus or the initial mandate that they were given um, uh, from the, coming out of the Finkel review was essentially to propose a, um, a, a, it does include a list of opportunities that need to be accelerated, but the intention was to create a, um, a transmission plan to make sure that we're advancing the right transmission projects in the right order to facilitate the renewables build out. Um, and that's what the that's what the key focus. If you read in the ISP about an optimal development path, there's a huge chunk of it is about this optimal development path. That's not an optimal development path that spells out every wind farm and solar farm. The optimal development path is which major transmission trunk projects should we build in what order, right? And so this is where there's a huge confusion about um, what the ISP is actually about and what they optimize and what they cost because their actual focus is to produce an optimal development path. It shouldn't be called that. It should be, it should be called the optimal transmission development path. And to figure out what is optimal for the transmission development path, they also model what will fit in the rest of the system, right? And that's, and that's, um, that's, that's, a, that's a secondary optimization where they say they run a computer program that says, what is the most efficient mix of generators that we can put in here? And, uh, and that's the optimization that everybody has assumed is kind of the perfect whole of the system. We've got everything covered and everything is optimized and everything is costed. Um, but that's not actually true. It is a limited optimization, a constrained optimization that incorporates, for example, our emissions targets. And they only include those costs which they think will move in response to where they, which transmission projects. So there are huge parts of the cost base of the energy system in particular, um, uh, all the distribution network, that's the low voltage wires that go up and down the street and the small substations around cities, not the massive cross-country ones that are on huge high wires, but the, yeah. the inner streets ones, the distribution network is not costed. That's not modeled as a cost in the ISP at all. They assume it exists. They have it a thing that connects to all the solar panels. Guess what? All the solar panels on roofs, all the rooftop solar that's built out in the ISP is not costed. They just assume that that exists. There's no cost associated with the rooftop solar panels. Same with, and this is enormous, all the power walls that are assumed to make up the virtual power plants that provide tens of gigawatts of crucial firming capacity. That's not costed. There's no cost for that. They model that it exists. They model this thing in their models that is you know, producing all these electrons and flowing and balancing out the needs. There's no cost associated for that. In, uh, in the ISP. So the idea that the ISP reflects whole of system costs is blatantly false. Uh, I don't know how they are able to repeat that in good faith. Um, they're not costed. They just assume that that is going to be a part of the system and they're trying to build an optimal transmission plan around that system they assume to exist. And it's when you understand that that's what they're trying to do is build an optimal transmission plan and only cost the things that they think will change in response to the transmission plan. That's when you realize what they actually have costed in the ISP. And it is nothing like the whole system. And it is incredible. I just cannot believe it that they keep on coming out and saying this reflects whole of system costs when that is so blatantly and explicitly untrue. Wow. It's uh, it's actually, uh, I I don't know what words to to put to that. I mean, we are talking about something so significant and 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 a and an infrastructure undertaking that I don't think this country has ever attempted before. Yeah, and it's based on wrong modeling. So you just talked about 
uh, the GenCost um, chief economist coming out and confirming uh, the the claims that you'd made. Uh, have you heard anything from AMIO about this? Because AMIO is a, a, a pretty big, um, well, it's the energy market operator, right? Like it's a pretty yep. big organization. Have they responded to any of these claims as yet? I mean, I know this is pretty early in the in in the uh, in the sort of revelations that you're making. Yeah, no. So, so this the sequence is that that what I'm referring to that press release was a response to the the allegations that I was making, right? So, right. so the sequence is the first piece that was quoted um, that quoted my work that Claire wrote, that got the response from Paul Graham from the CSIRO. Then I wrote some more on Twitter, and Claire picked up some threads in that and uh, and produced a second piece. That was the piece that mentioned the integrated system plan, and I had, she quoted me as saying that it didn't include the full system costs. And at that point, I was quite confident that was true, but I hadn't plumbed the depths of the extent to which that was true. But because I'd said something to the effect of not all the costs are included in that, um, or, or Claire said that, then AEMO did respond directly to that. That was this press release, the title of which is, um, I hope I get the words right, but ISP reflects whole of system costs. So this is the response. And this, this, is, this is the lie that you're talking about. That's, that's right. I can't find yeah. any any nicer way of putting it it is it is it is literally a lie like when you say directly like you know a falsehood um in response to it, it's 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 just a lie any normal person on the street would call this a lie um and so and that's what's crazy because that actually was a response and i didn't know how true how how massively true the extent to which was true what i'd what i'd said that didn't include the full system costs and since that and all the people that have hacked back and and taken up that AEMO response and waved it around on Twitter and said, oh, look at you, silly Aiden, this is written for you. This is Simon Holmes, of course. Uh, of course. Um, but I would, that, that has been brandished on Twitter to slap me down. And anyway, then I dug a little bit deeper and sort of got my head around and found deep in the data packs where they have their charts that are the full system costs. And they don't include anything like the full system costs. It's a mislabeled graph. It's the little bits of the system that we think will change in the whole system. Um, uh, in our transmission planning. Um, that's what it is. So they've kind of mislabeled their graphs and somehow believed that they include the full system cost there. But when you look at the numbers there and what's in there, it's absolutely clear. And now, now Simon Holmes, the court and everyone else is acknowledging plain as day, yes, they don't include the distribution network. No, they don't include the distributed energy resources. But their response is, oh, but why should they? That was outside the boundaries of the purview of what they had to do. But again, this question is, is like, even if that's a technical boundary of your organization, it is being used by policymakers when you say whole of system costs to understand what our future energy pathway is going to be and how much it's going to cost us. Well, and as you said earlier, it's all about the cost of electricity, right? And I'm not sure the exact breakup, but distribution costs uh, are one. anywhere between, uh, yeah, I thought it was around 50%. Uh, of I don't think it's quite tricky, but it could be forty. I mean, yeah, it's but it's it's it's, it's the it's biggest high. single component. The distribution network is the biggest single component, and there is no chance at all that we will be able to have like the entire um, you know a huge fraction of people with houses with solar panels and batteries that are able to charge those and feed them back to other people that don't have the batteries within the same network. Compensate for the whole loss of you know sunshine on when a cloud blows over somewhere else. Those and, and have their electric vehicles charge the electric vehicles, send all the electric vehicle charge back to the grid. May, and, and the sorts of things that they should have been modeling is maybe we maybe we can count on people having their electric vehicles available to charge the grid if we could charge their vehicles maybe twice as fast. Maybe if they could charge on the street too outside, then they there would be more charge available, more time to get back to the grid. But those kind of upgrades to facilitate people charging twice as fast in their garage, for example, or being able to charge out on the street, would be tremendous, enormous upgrades to the distribution network. Um, and there's just no effort to cost any of that. There's no kind of question about that. They just assume that we'll get to the point that people have the majority of the electric vehicle charging is done at a time that is convenient to the grid, basically. And only a small minority of their charging will be done, you know, when you get back from work and want to charge When you want to do it. <laughs> when you want to do it, right? So so those kind of things, uh, those assumptions, and the crazy thing is they've, they've modeled the outcome of that in terms of when the electrons will flow in explicit detail, like they, they, they are they are saying what they assume will happen, but there's no cost associated with any of that in their in their model, and and that is that is the absolute kind of bombshell kind of conclusion collapsing um, uh, realization that makes you realize that this whole thing is built on 
you know, a false illusion. Like, you know, this idea that none of this, um, none of this support for the grid from power walls and electric vehicles has a cost associated with it. Well, the, um, what you just said, remind, like, I often say this is the first energy transition uh, in history that has been government mandated. And really what you're explaining here is a system where the government has said, this is how we, this is where we need to be in 20 years, not, not let the market decide. This is where we need to be in, in 20 years because of a, a climate catastrophe and we need to get to net zero. And this is how we're going to model it in our bureaucratic world of, of zero costs and uh, all those sorts of absurdities that just don't live in the real world. Yep. Um, it is, it is absolutely, absolutely mind boggling. Um, I, I don't, uh, I, I was going to say the next question would, would probably be uh, you were just talking about um, uh, the solar and, and the amount of solar that's assumed uh, that's going in, into the grid. Now mm. um, there is already, you know, Australia is probably one of the the most advanced countries in terms of having uh, solar panels on roofs. Mm. I guess there's a lot of areas built up in cities where there's uh, apartments that are not going to be able to to do that sort of stuff as well. Uh, but it is a fast growing area because the government is subsidising it so heavily. You were mentioning uh, earlier when we were speaking um, off camera that th there's an interesting idea that you have for. Uh, a retailer of of non solar energy. Maybe I, I thought it might be just worth explaining how that works. I thought it was quite interesting. Yeah, yeah. At the moment, at the moment, this is um uh, this is a key assumption that's made again. Uh, as I, as I mentioned in the ISP, it's assumed that rooftop solar expands massively. I can't remember now whether it's tripled or quadrupled or five times, but there's a huge expand. We have we already have a lot, and it's assumed that it will expand a whole lot more. And the funny thing is, is that solar at the moment, in terms of big commercial installers, that has pretty much stalled at the moment because we're at the point where the economics are starting to get tricky and they need extra systems added. To and so the business cases for the major operators has stalled completely. Um, maybe not completely. I'm sure a few more will get over the line, but it's yep. it's slowing uh, to a halt, which is what you expect when you get to high levels of solar. You're talking um, grid grid scale solar. That's there, the grid scale ones, but 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 the but the rooftop ones, they're still roaring ahead, and it's important to understand why they're roaring ahead, and and that is basically an artifact of our energy pricing system that we have for electricity. Um, as you pointed out, the largest single component of the bill is the distribution network. Um, the next one is probably the actual raw electricity, but it's a minority. It's no more than roughly a third. Yep. Um, and then there's also a margin for the retailer and there's the transmission network as well, which is smaller than distribution network. So, so, but, but only about, let's call it a third of your energy bill is actually the cost of getting the energy uh, itself. Most of the cost is about getting it into all the wires and through the wires into the home, which is a fixed cost, right? So if energy bills were truly reflective of cost, the, the the energy retailers would basically just charge you a fixed amount, which would be two thirds of an average bill for all that connection infrastructure. Yep. And that they would, um, and and then if you were a solar owner, then you the most you could ever save from having the biggest possible solar system and all the batteries in the world would be a third of the bill, unless you got totally off grid and, and got rid of that distribution cost. Yep. That of course would kill solar investment. Um, people wouldn't people wouldn't have a good business case to invest in their own solar. But at the moment, because there's this huge saving that you can make, um, people are still uh, by reducing because because the retailers they recover the distribution and the um, and the transmission costs through your usage charge. They basically say well, we're going to charge you a premium on how much electricity you pull out um uh th to cover that cost as well even though it's a fixed cost so that is the basis of a, a, a substantial i suppose it is a cost shifting uh which is a problem however there's another opportunity though um which is to do with what happens when you get lots and lots and lots of solar in the grid which we're starting to approach it's most acute in south australia at the moment um, but we can see this happening for example in germany and other places where where renewables are great and you have these good moments and sunny days and the spot price plunges, it goes yep. down, it can go down to zero, it can go, it can become negative, right? So um, so that means that the the energy retailers, when they're buying power to serve up to their customers, they have to figure out some average price of this highly shifting spot price that goes from quite high in the evenings to down to low or zero or nothing in the middle of the day. Um, and there's a problem here because energy retailers try to serve up the same average price to all their customers but increasingly significant numbers of customers the solar users they will never buy 
much power or any power when it's beautifully sunny. And that will increasingly be times when the price is very, very low and negative, right? And the, and the retailers there, they have some margin to be made because they're not paying for a lot of, uh, um, uh, you know, the, the, you know, power is cheap then and they're selling the same average price. But but, they, but their solar customers, they always consistently buy in the evenings when there's no sun, when the price is the highest, right? So they've got to figure out an average. And basically, if they didn't have solar users um, in their uh, in their um, in their mix that only bought at expensive times and never bought at the cheap times, they would have a cheaper average, right? So there's an opportunity. I can't quite figure out why this hasn't happened yet. I think it's I think it's probably the case that it's just politically not seen as a very good thing to do is to have a differentiated pricing pricing structure, have a special yeah. deal that is just for the people that are non-solar um, homes and say, we can rely on you buying the average across the whole lot. And uh, and guess what? We can offer you a lower price um, because we don't have to serve you always expensive power and never when it's cheaper. And so I think there's an opportunity there for a you know, bold player or a new mover in the market to say, "Hey, we've got a we've got a we've got a great rate for non-solar people." And, and at the moment, it's probably I'm not sure exactly the size of the margin, but I think there would be something you would be able to offer an edge that would beat out any other retailer that has a, a big part of their custom base, including solar users. Um, and the more solar we get, the bigger that edge will become because the price will plunge further and further more reliably when it's sunny. Um, and uh, and the difference between that and the peak times will become larger to cover the whole cost of the all, overall system. So well, it might be a great business case today, or it might be a good business case today. It'll be a great business case at some point soon to differentiate those two. And it's uh, and it's surprising to me that I haven't really seen it happen yet. But um, but yeah, maybe maybe some of your listeners know why it hasn't happened, or maybe some of your listeners want to uh, to try to make it happen. Well, I think you hit the nail on the head as to why it probably hasn't happened. There is these days a lot of. Uh, let's say brand risk about being seen to be uh, cold and calculating in terms of your profit rather than uh, lovely and green and, yep. and, uh, and, and virtue signaling. So I yep. think we're getting to the point where people are going to see uh, increases in electricity bills and the CPI number that just came out this week showed that just for the month of July, electricity prices jumped 6%, but if not for uh, the rebates that were coming through, that would have been a near 20% jump. And I know that's based on a reset an annual reset of electricity prices, but these uh, numbers and these costs are going to figure more and more into people's budgeting every day. Yeah. And and you're right. If if someone can offer them an alternative to cut their costs, because uh, you know it, 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 the electricity electricity prices, gas prices. I know people in in Victoria are getting slugged with with huge prices down there. People will look to to have an alternative. Uh, Final question. You mentioned uh, at the start of the the interview that you had done some work around nuclear uh, physics. What is your, uh, I mean, based on my very uh, entry level or very um, man on the street level of analysis of nuclear, it is the most energy dense fuel that we have. Uh, sure, it the technical challenges of building uh, plants are, are, are quite quite significant, but we've been doing it around the world for 50 to 60, 70 years. Um, and the more that we do it, the more technological advances and and uh, that we'll, we'll make. Just going back to the GenCost report, I think that mm. one of the key claims around that is that we are not going to follow the nuclear route because it's mm. too expensive relative mm. to renewables. So yeah. presumably your view is that is incorrect. So let's just um, assume that. Uh, but what, what do you think is the likelihood of, of nuclear making any sort of renaissance in Australia? I, I think it is, I think it is likely um, a bit of a question about when and who, who starts it and how it gets off the ground. But I, I think that there is strong support in the population to do to reduce our carbon emissions. Um, uh, that said, there is sensitivity to what that costs us and and the economic pain that's that's needed to take that. The most important thing that I am really trying to get is just clarity and transparency and honesty about what the cost is. If there's a small cost uh, premium to uh, to to reduce our carbon emissions and we can be clear about what that is and get political support to do that, um, that's understandable. But the the problem, yeah. The chances are, I think, okay, provided we get to the point of transparency, because nuclear costs, they do have some high costs. And I think one of the reasons that we've got to this point where CSIRO is so confident that, you know, it's it's too high, is that nuclear costs, they never get missed. Like they all their costs are kind of upfront things. They yeah. are things that are associated with a very complicated engineering build 
you can put your finger on all of them, including the waste storage, right? You know, you've got to account for that. So how do you, you know, another engineering challenge, okay, well, you know, you've got to budget for all that. Um, but nuclear's challenges and their costs are kind of front-loaded and concentrated. They're up front, right? So it's very hard to get, you know, find the right side, build all the deep foundations. Once you do build that and get all those front-loaded costs uh, done, it's extremely economical like it's extremely cheap to run the fuel is very cheap i mean there's still there's still smart people manning the power plant but it produces a prodigious amount of electricity and the economics are very good uh once you've built it um and the frustrating thing to me is that at the moment we've got this impression that nuclear is extremely expensive and there are ways in which i believe those figures have been inflated and and made to look worse than they actually are i haven't dug deeply into those but i know that people have and at some point probably will um, but I think that the problem is at the moment is that nuclear, which is hard and has costs, all the costs are up front. The Western world hasn't been building reactors for a long time. We've struggled with those upfront costs. Yep. There have been more or less cold starts attempted in the West for small bills, and they've been very expensive. The reason I'm still optimistic is at the moment we're just catching up with what the true cost of the renewable system is. And I think the true cost is just very hard to estimate because the system is so dispersed. It's so diffuse. It's so yep. non-dense, it's so non-concentrated, and not just in a kind of energy density sense, but in terms of actually where that system is in an institutional sense. Who has responsibility for building the system? Um, whose cost is it? One person has to do the transmission network, someone has to connect a battery, um, their different business cases, what do they depend on? The government builds a dam somewhere else. Between all the different layers of government and all the different built-up subsidies we have, and consumers are expected to pay their part, they build up by the power walls, like... It is such a diffuse and dispersed and undense system that it is very hard to actually gather together and figure out what the true costs are. And that's what I'm trying to draw attention to is how poorly that has been done to date. But Absolutely. I am fairly confident that once we do that properly and actually understand the true costs, the renewable systems probably looks quite expensive, very expensive, I think. I, so, think, I think you're right on that. <laughs> I, yeah, I, I, I'm pretty confident, right? Because we haven't got anywhere close to getting an honest assessment out of the out of AIMA or the or CSIRO. So once you put all that together, I think you'll and pull in all those costs from the dispersed places and what you have to pay car users to not drive at the time they want to, whatever else, it'll look very expensive. And I think that we'll realise that nuclear looks relatively cheap. And I'm optimistic that uh, that nuclear costs will come down if people commit to building it in suitable scales, etc. Um, you can stuff up nuclear, you can stuff up anything. Yep. But at the moment, we've got cascading stuff ups in different parts of the renewable systems. Oh, there's snowy hydro over here. Oh, scratch your head. Why aren't enough wind farms being built here? Oh, I'm not quite sure whether we can get the transmission permission from the farmers. There are like, there are, there are, there are cascading stuff ups, but it's all diffuse. It's in different places. It's yep. no one's fault. The impact of all of them combined on the whole system is hard to map out. And so we just think that it's still okay and we can keep pushing through all that. Uh, whereas for a nuclear build, when one part doesn't go together, the whole thing stops and everyone points at last and says, oh, terrible, terrible delay, that'll push it out. And it does push it out and the costs escalate. At the moment, the costs are escalating in the, in the renewable system. There are blowouts, there are delays, there are huge problems, but because it's so diffuse, different layers of government, different organisations, different responsibilities. No one's got a strong handle on what it means for the whole system and you can't add up the cost very easily. So that's, um, yeah, that's my take. I think we'll get to nuclear eventually once we have wrestled with the full cost of the renewable system, which which just hasn't been done properly to date. Well, Aidan, I think you're doing uh, some tremendous work on exposing those costs and I want to thank you for that and uh, certainly thank you for your time today explaining to people, you know, just what it is that we are trying to achieve as a country and some of the, uh, I guess, some of the lies that we're being told. And I think the more that people uh, understand what's really happening, uh, the better choices that we'll make in the future. So I hope um, I hope you continue to do your work uh, and uh, anything, I'll be following you on Twitter. Perhaps if uh, people do want to follow you, mate, just uh, let us know how they can how they can find you. Yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, at Quixotic quant uh q q u i x o t i c q u a n t with with both q's capitalized at quixotic quant um see so you're a you're you're a don quixote fan it's quite ironic that you've got a uh, a guy tilting at windmills uh <laughs> on your twitter thing and you're right. doing you're doing anything but <laughs> the windmills are collapsing <laughs> yeah, exactly exactly yeah. all right mate thanks for joining us today really appreciate it thanks very much pleasure Greg. Thanks for joining What's Not Priced In, your weekly source of unique ideas in the Australian stock market. 
Now, if you've enjoyed this episode, please show your support by liking and subscribing and turn those post notifications so you don't miss a thing. And uh, stay tuned for the upcoming episodes as we delve into new topics, new trends, and new stocks. Thanks for your support. Hope to see you next week.